everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Look Before You Leap, Five Lessons Learned in an Insurance Hard Market. Our presenter today is Josh Lamberg. Josh is the founder and CEO of Signers National, a holding company that includes LAM insurance services. In today's discussion, Josh will cover the most common alternatives that organizations are considering to reduce their insurance cost in this hard market, as well as the benefits and risks associated with each. Thank you all again for joining us, and I'll hand it over to you, Josh. Thanks, Carly. Here's what we're going to talk about uh, what is this hard market? Uh, anybody on here that is an insurance buyer has heard hard market. Um, so uh, we're going to explain what that is. There's five things uh, after we walk through that. There's five things that um, are, are recurring instances we've seen in this hard market, some of which consumer insurance consumers are aware of, some they're not aware of, and so you know, and and some strategies they've used to reduce costs. Um, and then we're going to try to arm you with like good questions to be asking whether you're dealing with us as you go through a renewal with an account manager, whether you're dealing with somebody else. So this hard market, you know, that term means essentially that insurance prices are rising. Um, and we've been talking about a hard market since really since COVID hit. Um, and there have been kind of almost stair steps to this hard market. And it is historically one of the longest hard markets uh, that the insurance industry has has ever seen. Um, so, what are some of these? What are some of the factors that are driving this hard market? So, in property insurance, in property insurance, you have increased construction costs, uh, high frequency of environmental and changing weather patterns, and and increased catastrophic claims. On the casualty side, we've got sympathetic juries with unprecedented catastrophic awards the CVA or Child's Victim Act um, and statute of limitations being opened up on that um, and, um, and, and the removal of any of those limitations. Before we go on to the next slide, systematically what, what I want everyone to think about is, right, insurance is risk transfer. So whether that's liability through a lawsuit or property damage, Right? We're transferring the risk to an insurance carrier. Those carriers, um, in large, their job is to accurately price the cost of taking on that risk, so that they can, you know, so that they can indemnify, make everybody whole, and still stay profitable. So the key to that is understanding what risk they're going to take. The key is understanding and being able to predict losses. Um, and when we talk about this hard market, right, it's the predictability of losses in an overarching theme um, or the lack thereof, um, the predictability of losses that is causing these prices to go higher. When we think about property, we can think about, right, a freezing, uh, a freezing storm down in Texas or in the Carolinas. Uh, we think about, you know, we're hearing more and more often a once in a century flood that's not happening once in a century, but insurance carriers use predictive modeling to understand what losses they're going to incur. And as our weather patterns change due to global warming, right, the, their ability to model and predict losses in property insurance in particular has gone way down. So, you know, what do carriers do? Uh, as they run a financial model, when one part of that model becomes less predictable, they start to focus on other parts of their financial model, which we're going to get into in a second. We see the same thing in casualty. Um, anytime we look at the newspaper and we see, you know, these 20 million, 50 million, 100 million dollar lawsuits that get settled, we have these catastrophic casualty um, settlements that have been historically unprecedented. So um, one of the questions that, that we'll probably get is how, you know, do you see this coming to an end soon? Um, and, and I don't see any, there's no indications I'm getting right now that say, you know, that the, the predictive analytics from insurance carriers when it comes to 
most of the property and casualty market are going to get stronger. We're not, we're still seeing unpredictable weather and, you know, kind of severe catastrophic um, claim settlements. So that is when, when somebody wants to know why, you know, why are prices going up? It's because the, it's, it's because insurance carriers have a harder and harder time modeling what claims are going to be paid that at a macro level, that's what is driving this hard market along with some other factors. So to kind of get another cut down in this hard market, um, what we see here is how the insurance marketplace is how carriers want insurance to work. For every dollar of claims that come in, they want to spend 50 cents on that paying claims, 35%, 35 cents on overhead and 15% 15 of that dollar in profit. That's how carriers want to see their insurance model work. So what we have seen uh, recently is two things, uh, social inflation, and that's the term, uh, that's the insurance industry term for these large catastrophic casualty claims, right? So we see social liability claims are settling much higher and we see less predictable property losses. What happens when you have less predictable property losses is insurance carriers buy reinsurance. So reinsurers wind up paying more claims in their property, which historically was a very profitable line of coverage. So that has gotten less profitable in the reinsurance market. So reinsurers are starting to charge more. So note that on the left in that 85% in that combined ratio and combined is overhead and claims. In the left, it was 35. There's another you know, it's almost a 15% increase or another 5% of every dollar is being spent on reinsurance. So you have overhead going up and their total claims payouts going up and you get these models. You can see the total red here is greater than the dollar. So we're getting insurance carriers that are running 110, 105, 115% combined ratio, which means they're losing money on their entire portfolio in, in actually underwriting insurance. So what does that industry do? Of course, they react. That so you get these increasing prices. You now you now have to charge a dollar and a half to find that fifteen cents in profit of what previously was only a dollar. And so that at a macro level and and kind of taking it down from thirty thousand to twenty thousand feet is how this hard market works. Um, so I'm sure there'll be some more questions on that, that that we can answer at the end. One of the things that we wanted to dig into, many of our clients are getting increases in their property premiums. And they're going, I, I don't have property losses. I don't understand why is my property premium going up? So I mentioned before that we have these unpredictable uh, weather events and, and insurance carriers are having a more and more difficult time predicting what happens on property. So when they can't predict what losses are going to be, what property carriers do is start to focus on what is controllable. What things that are controllable are understanding what they are insuring and are they insuring it properly? So if you take a look at this model, this is how property insurance has worked historically. Let's say we had two buildings and you'll note that the replacement value of the buildings each individually was $5 million at $250 a square foot. Historically, what we've been able to do is say, and, and I've, I know we've got many clients on here, I've, I've worked with you to do this and it's been our strategy. We're gonna create a blanket limit of property insurance and we're gonna insure each building at the lowest possible limit. So carriers allowed us to insure each of these two buildings at two and a half million dollars to give us a combined limit of $5 million. And we said, okay, with $5 million on any individual incident, 5 million bucks is enough to replace either one of these buildings. The chances that you lose 100% of both buildings at the same time is, is negligible. So we can value each building less. If the carrier agrees, they give us a blanket limit at 5 million bucks. We only paid premium on $5 million and we're covered in both places. 
So we've we've executed this strategy repeatedly with our clients for the last 15 years. Pete, let's show them what's going on now. Okay, so we have the same two buildings and they're at the same replacement cost. Building number one, $250 a square foot, building number two. However, carriers are carriers are starting to focus in on what they call ITV or insurance to value. It's another way to say, are you properly valuing your buildings? And this little game we've been getting away with, carriers are not letting brokers get away with anymore. So now they're saying, hey, this building, they're at, their carriers are digging in, they're looking at how the actual valuation, they're taking square footage and building values and saying, hey, the, the value of this building is not $125 a square foot that you have had it insured for. The value is $250 a square foot. So we're forcing your insured to increase the value of the building that they're paying for insurance on to the proper values. So on the left-hand side, we only had to buy insurance for $5 million of total real estate value. On the right-hand side, once carriers are waking up and saying, you have to insure this at $250 a square foot, now we have to buy $10 million worth of insurance. So although it looks like nothing changed, and, and I'm sure if any of our you know, any of us see why am I prop nothing happened? I didn't have any losses. Why, why is my property insurance going up? This is the reason. It's not really that our insurance or the rates are even going up, but carriers kind of across the board are requiring insureds to value their property appropriately. We've had a little, a little bit of a hack that we've been getting away with, and the industry as a whole has shut off that hack. And, and we're, we now have to represent the value of the buildings and, and each value, even if we have the blanket, each value has to be appropriate for the building that we're insuring. So um, that's what's happening amongst property. All right, so let's get into these five questions. Um, that we should ask or considerations that we should take. So the first, I wanna talk about three known and manageable financial risk considerations. Should I lower my limits? Should I increase my deductibles? And can I reduce the organization's footprint and still execute on our mission? We're having, these are the first two are conversations we're having at, I mean, nearly every single renewal. We're saying, do I, I used to buy $50 million of insurance. Now, do I need to buy 50? Can I buy 25? Can I buy 10? What are the requirements? Um, so we're having the deductible, we're having this at every single renewal conversation. And number three, we're gonna get into more later on, um, talking about, can I reduce the footprint of my organization? All right, what are some of the things, we've actually had a couple clients that left and said, Josh, we got a better deal and it saved us a whole bunch of money. And I was involved in a couple of conversations where I said, this doesn't make sense, but if you can save 300,000 bucks, I, I, I can't see how you cannot take it. And then what happened was in two different instances, clients came back to us and went, uh, we, didn't, we didn't get what we thought we were paying for. Um, and there was some stress, but ultimately things worked out. So Pete, let's talk about some unknown risks, right? switching from claims made and occurrence coverage, more restrictive exclusions, limitations, gaps in coverage, right? There, you know, in any industry, there are people that are experts, there are people that are professionals, and, and there are people that are less than that. Um, so I wanna make sure everybody is aware of that. We, we had some stressful moments on both sides and, and we were fortunate, we have great relationships, everything worked out, um, but, We'll talk about those things that you know some some people got kind of hoodwinked with, and we'll make sure that nobody on this call has that happen to them. Okay, um, lowering policy limits. Um, so this is right. We have a nonprofit that had fifty million in real estate, uh, 200, 250, uh, 200 units of housing. 250,000 in premium. And so they started considering lower limits in umbrella. Their, their lending, their lender required 5 million, they were buying 10 million, and they were able to reduce that umbrella limit from 10 to five while maintaining, you know, and, and created a $222,000 savings. Um, 
So again, we've had clients with 50 million in limits, 25 million in limits, and, and nobody, I, I, I think nearly nobody is buying 50 million in limits anymore. The excess liability market has become particularly expensive. So what we've done is compare limits uh, within your peer group. So other human service organizations that have budgets at similar size, and making sure that we're um, discussing and, um, and sharing claims examples, right? Depending on, depending on exactly what your exposures are, what your operations are, taking lower limits may have greater or, or less risk for you. Um, taking a look at your individual loss history. What's your history of claims? If you've had nothing um, and, and there's large exposures or the history is small frequency claims as opposed to severity claims, that's something we want to consider. Um, of course, you know, state and funding regulations are critical when we consider what limits assurance we're buying. And then looking at the organization's overall financial stability, um, right? If, if, our, if our budget is really thin and we're saving 22,000 bucks and there's very little surplus, right? And, you know, uh, that may not make sense because a $6 million claim could put the entire organization out of business. Um, but these are the types of questions we'll ask. Lowering limits is something that we are commonly seeing. Excess liability, particularly for some of the larger uh, human service and not-for-profit organizations, uh, for some of our clients with budgets over 100 million, we have seen them, you know, historically buying 25 or 50 million, and that's coming down to 25 being the ceiling, and 15 and 10 million is is kind of where um, we can work with anybody individually, but where we see that bell curve now. Okay, so common strategy. And and one and one that we recommend highly considering. Should I increase my deductibles to reduce my premiums? Um, so we had a large nonprofit that had no deductible. Um, this was actually uh, this was actually a bit of a um, this was somebody that left and wound up coming back. This is a specific example. So they had first dollar insurance. Right, there was no risk. There was a hundred percent risk transfer, um, and we had this person went and considered a deductible. And we've changed the numbers, and obviously there's no names here. Um, but when you talk about deductibles, what you want to do is understand what kind of consistent losses that your organization will deliver. Now, property deductibles. Um, are, are fairly easy to consider. We can look at property losses and look at loss history. When you get into casualty losses, uh, things can get a little more complicated. Pete, could you could you drive this example? So over we're just coming out of COVID. And what we've seen over the past handful of years during COVID is actually a reduction in claims. Now, there's multiple reasons for that. You have things like vehicles that weren't on the road, so we have a lot less auto claims, uh, less people moving around, more teleservice, you know, telephone services or video services. There's actually less client uh, foot traffic. Um, so what we see in the recent history for most of our clients is a lull in the number of claims. So if you look back through 2020, as an example, this particular client has got a lull in claims. Now. When we consider when we consider also that the court system has been backed up, and the industry is still seeing claims being reported from late 19 and 2020, that's going to depress the amount of claims you see in your recent loss history even further. So when somebody was com considering a deductible, what we really want to look at is kind of a, a typical run rate of your organization's claims over a more typical operational period. So if we were going to create a deductible analysis and say, how many claims would we expect? I wouldn't consider 2021 or 22. I really would put, I would consider that very lightly. Uh, even 19 is not what we call fully developed, but I would put heavy consideration on 16, 17, and 18 because that's more a typical run rate for your organization. And if we created a, a claims analysis, if we created an expected, like incurred within your deductible, those are the years that we would want to use 
to do a appropriate financial analysis of what the organization would would is most likely to incur within a deductible. So so that was a um, that that was a big affirmation, a big realization with one of our clients taking a look over the last three years and saying, here's what my claims are and here's what I expect them to be. It's certainly possible, but a, a more conservative, a more prudent financial analysis is let's look at the organization before COVID. And if the services and deliverables are the same, then that's where we should look at claims being. So, so that's the type of analysis we want to make sure everyone's doing when we consider deductibles, especially deductibles on casualty, general liability, professional liability, abuse. We see very little auto liability deductibles, uh, but that's that's a really important analysis. Um, so impact on cash flow. It's not that deductibles, even on the casualty side, can't be effective because it does take some time for those claims to pay out. But a proper analysis uh, of that short and long-term view is what's appropriate. Being in, compliant, in compliance, again, with funding sources. We've seen this as an issue. We've seen some of our clients want to consider larger deductibles. Um, and some of the funding sources reject and push back against that. Uh, and if you're taking these law, if you're taking these deductibles, making sure that you are investing in loss control, right? Because now we're transferring less risk. We have to make sure that right, the, it's those first dollars that would impact the organization. Making sure we're running as safe and well protected an organization as we can is really critical. Okay. Um, Reducing risk through outsourcing and or downsizing. This has been by far the most effective strategy. Reducing risk by outsourcing or downsizing has been the most effective strategy in reducing premiums. So, you know, and if somebody wants to talk to me about this, feel free to reach out to us. We, we have recommendations specifically around vehicle fleets, right? We've seen... In this example, we saw somebody reduce their fleet by 30%. The premium comes down by 30%. You, you can't get anything that is more direct. If you have cars that are sitting around not being used, if you can use your fleet more efficiently, getting those vehicles off of your vehicle list is a direct reduction in your auto premium. It then becomes a reduction in your excess liability premium because those umbrella coverages are a factor of the underlying casualty premiums. So you get a bit of a multiplying factor, um, not to mention that auto is consistently the loss leader in, in every one of our nonprofits. Auto is always the, the ha drives the most losses. And when your vehicles have losses, of course, your auto premiums go up, the, which drives up the overall premium. It drives up your umbrella premium. Generally, when those losses happen, it's because your employees are in the car getting hurt, which then goes back and affects your workers' comp premiums. So vehicles are back on the road, right? We, we've got pretty normal auto traffic in and around the greater New York City area. Focusing on that auto fleet and looking and saying, are, you know, are we using the fleet in the best manner? We've had a number of clients that said, here, there's some routes that are, that are the same exact routes every day. We partnered with some outsourced companies and had and had a separate vendor be able to run that route, take the client, take those consumers from their residence to a day hab program and back. You know, the one-off doctor's appointments or community service, that's difficult to outsource. But when you have consistent routes that are run every day, it's very outsourceable. It's been a great strategy. We've seen we had a client that had 150 vehicles on the road take that down to 75. And we're working with loss control. We're putting GPS in every vehicle to make sure they're more safe. And it's having a dramatic effect on their overall premiums. Um, Pete. Thank you. Switching between claims made and occurrence. Um, so a large human service organization with daycare operations had an expiring claims made policy with a retro date of 2010. Uh, on abuse molestation. And ultimately, right, 
claims made and occurrence policies can be one of the more complicated insurance um, strategies that, that in, uh, it can be one of the more complicated strategies that carriers use to manage their risk. Um, and subsequent to this uh, webinar, I'm gonna work on producing a, a video to help everybody understand this, we'll share it. But a claims made policy means that the policy I buy in this year will cover it, will cover claims that are made in this year from incidents that occurred historically. Okay, I'll say that again. A claims made policy means if somebody sues me today for something that happened 10 years ago, today's policy can cover it. An occurrence policy means if an event happens today and I have an occurrence policy, this policy will cover it. So if somebody slipped and fell today and I have an occurrence policy, but they wait two years to bring a lawsuit, the policy I have today will still cover it. I really feel like these are uh, considerations that are easy to understand with uh, with pictures, but what everybody should be aware of is an organization. This was another circumstance where somebody had a claims made policy that said, okay, anything that happens in the past 10 years, I will cover it in today's policy. And somebody offered them an occurrence policy and they said, well, it's, it's much cheaper. And they took this occurrence policy. It wasn't until almost a month later where they shared the information with us. And I said, listen, I, I got to let you know, everything that happened over the last 10 years, you now have no coverage for. They said, what? I said, because you switched from claims made to occurrence, you no longer have a claims made policy. So if something happened 10 years ago or three years ago or two years ago or last year, and the claim is made today, an occurrence policy does not cover that. And you have no coverage for any, uh, any uh, incident that occurred prior to the beginning of this policy. Needless to say, that came undone. We were able to get the claims made coverage back in place, um, but, but in making sure that you are aware of if you have claims made coverage, that there's continuity in coverage, if you have occurrence coverage, that you, you're keeping that, this is one of the biggest risks um, that there are. And uh, as we said before, there are unscrupulous people out there. There are people that, that mean well, but aren't experts. Uh, and, and at times this can be, this can lead to, this can lead to a total omission in insurance coverage. So this is something we gotta be particularly careful of. Okay. Um, are there more restrictive exclusions or limitations on my policy? Um, so here I wanna go through some specific examples Many carriers are reducing their coverage. Some of the industry leaders that were giving coverages to five and $10 million of umbrella limits are now reducing their limits to one, two, or three million. Um, there's, some, there's some carriers that are not industry leaders that are putting really misleading exclusions on their policies. So this is another one um, where things can look the same and having a professional be detailed and go through the, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's on the specific forms within your quota, within your policy is critical. And we wanted to show you some specific examples here. So um, this was, we're dealing with, we had a church uh, that came to us. They have a large congregation. They're, they're, uh, this happened to be an organization in the Bronx on the right hand side of your screen. It, it's it's very difficult to see, but we've we've kind of blown up the the critical material here. So um, they thought they had created a savings, and ultimately uh, they came to us because it was at a renewal. We identified this, the and this carrier included this language. This exclusion applies to actual or alleged defective hazardous conditions. Uh, that are present in the sidewalk, um, which is a matter of applicable stature code and ordinance. Ultimately, this was an exclusion for a slip and fall that happens on a sidewalk. 
right? It's this specific language that eliminated coverage that in your regular general liability form is very typical. Slip and falls happen all the time. This is specific language that eliminated coverage for a slip and fall on a sidewalk. To me, this felt almost egregious that a carrier could and would do something like that. Uh, but there are ENS carriers. There are carriers that are not dedicated to the space where, where at times a broker kind of tries to force a, a square peg in a round hole and you get these really unique exclusions. But, but a slip and fall on your sidewalk is something that I would say our clients expect to be covered. Um, and reading the language of the policy, especially in this uh, hard market, seeing carriers that you're not familiar with, um, and being particularly careful about the language and the policy is really important. Stuff like this does exist. Um, okay, and a uh, an organization that was dealing with uh, some DD clients. Um, so abuse and molestation. We've seen the Child Victims Act. We saw the statute of limitations open up uh, and go back. You know, uh, now I believe it's sixty five years. So. Abuse and molestation is a coverage that can have catastrophic uh, right claims associated with it. So we're seeing we're seeing a lot of limitations and or exclusions as it's related to abuse. Uh, again, this is a real policy that we had you know where where we were able to identify this and provide enhanced coverage. But this insurance does not apply to any conduct, physical uh, gesture, sexual contact, whether consensual or non. Uh, this is a abuse and molestation exclusion on their policy. Uh, so this is coverage that if you, now it's easy, if you have not had abuse and molestation claims, it's easy to say we have this coverage and not really paid any attention. And it and hopefully none of the clients or prospects ever have an abuse and molestation claim. When they happen, they're scary and can be significant and making sure uh, just because we, you know, we buy insurance for the stuff that we're concerned about happening. Just because we have not had a claim doesn't mean it can't happen, and doesn't mean we shouldn't put our due diligence on making sure that the insurance reacts properly. So, abuse and molestation exclusions, uh, more and more is more and more exclusions and limitations are going on. Um, so, we were talking about limitations. Um, and here we see just that. So this is an excerpt from an umbrella policy. So somebody might have been buying a $5 million umbrella or a $10 million umbrella. And historically, they had full limits of abuse and professional liability through the umbrella. Uh, and you can see here in Section D, professional liability is still $5 million. But it is uh, nearly all carriers are sublimiting, uh, are sublimiting abuse. There are two or three carriers out there. Uh, Berkeley Human Services, one. I've seen Chubb um, that are still providing full limits of abuse. Um, but um, there is a there's a church mutual a product that can provide five and 10 million limits of abuse. But it, it is a diminishing group. There's about three carriers in the greater New York City area. It's not much more than that. And so, so your organization may or may not have um, an option, right? It may be a class of business that none of those carriers will entertain. With that said, you should be aware if you are taking on more exposure, looking at the limits in the umbrella for professional and abuse molestation, and looking at the underlying limits of these, of these uh, coverages that can cover you for catastrophic incidences, you should be asking the questions, making sure you go over it at your renewal. Um, again, so along with coverage limitations and specific coverage exclusions, we have seen carriers start to exclude specific operations or locations. Uh, we had a client a couple of weeks ago, again, somebody that had a problem and came back and said, "I." You know, I bought something and Josh, I was told it had this. Ultimately, it excluded adult daycare. It excluded my day house or it excluded this large location. It's stuff that, that we have not seen kind of during COVID. We didn't see 
we saw COVID exclusions, but we didn't see exclusions like this for specific operations or locations. Um, it's something we got to be very mindful of. When, when a carrier gives a quote, they have to provide, if requested, they provide the specific language in the quote. They provide specific a forms list. So even before you bind it, it is possible to understand, and your broker should be telling you, whether it's LAM or somebody else, we need to be telling you what exactly it is you're buying. So we've got just a couple more minutes before we turn into some Q&A. And I'm sure there are people here going, okay, I, I, my, you know, my antenna is up. There's, I am concerned about these issues. Josh, what do we do about it? It's nice to be made aware, but tell us what we should execute on. So, um, Pete, if you don't mind going back one or two. Thank you, my friend. All right, on the right-hand side of the screen, we have what at LAM we call a premium and exposure comparison. And you know our friends from AHRC and Well Life are on. I know they've all seen this document. It's never been more important, right? Looking at what are the specific limits provided, looking at um, you know what coverage is, the continuity and occurrence versus claims made, getting a professional comparison between what you have and what is being proposed has never been more critical. Um, so uh, we we have a specific example of uh, some work that we did for a client. Pete, if you could bring it to that next, uh, thank you. So we had somebody tell us that, you know, the budget is being pressed. I need you to go out and look for every option. Show me anything that's available. Um, and in this scenario, we had on the far left was an occurrence option. The second to the left column was another occurrence option for abuse and molestation. So that's the incumbent was on the far left. The second column was the incumbent carrier saying, here's the renewal. And we went out to the market. What was available were just claims made options. And we didn't talk. Moving from occurrence to claims made is acceptable because those historic claims are covered by that occurrence policy. Now, moving into a claims made policy has some risk because leaving it can be very difficult. And at times claims made can be less expensive, right? There's no free lunches. That, that cheaper policy does come with some risk in the future. Um, but this is an example of where we were able to vet the market, provide different options and laying it out like this and showing exactly how uh, how there are differences in coverage. This is how it should be professionally done to give uh, any any insurance consumer options. Under right, this is the look before you leap. You have to understand you know, the potential risks with what you're buying. Um, so the moral of the story for there is anytime, Pete, if you could go back to the large kind of view one more time. Um, Anytime you're considering an option, you should be reviewing a document. This, this is our format. Doesn't need to be our format, but you should be reviewing a professional document that goes line by line and helps you understand the coverage you have versus any differences in coverage. It's never been more important in, than in this marketplace. Carriers are aggressively trying to reduce their exposure. They're doing it in some ways that are very upfront and obvious. They're doing it in other ways um, that are much less obvious. You got to get a professional review to vet all those options. Okay, thanks, Pete. Okay. Um, so some other considerations. Um, we've been looking at the industry for the past decade and a half has basically seen admitted insurance policies. An admitted policy means that the Department of Insurance backs claims against that policy if the company were to go bankrupt. Uh, with the exception of a risk retention group, any risk retention group <laughs> can be A-rated, but risk retention groups are not backed by the state guarantee fund. So understanding 
uh, if you're if you're looking at an A-rated admitted carrier, if it's an if it's a A-rated ENS carrier or excess and surplus lines carrier, that's where we tend to see more more uh, variable language and restrictive coverages. Um, we see a risk retention group can be admitted and can have standard forms, but at times, right, there is more financial risk to that. We've seen um, all different types of risk retention groups pop up. Some of them have joint and several liability. Um, and if anybody on this call was involved in any of the workers' compensation trusts that went under probably 10 years ago now, uh, it was heavy in the human service space. We all know there was assessments for years and years because there was joint and several liability. So asking questions about who the carrier is, also absolutely critical. Uh, going over some of the stuff that we reviewed. What are my, have my limits or my deductibles changed? Uh, have there been previous, has previous coverage or operations been excluded? Um, do I have any gaps? Do I have any gaps in my coverage? So we are seeing more and more commonly two different carriers used to create an insurance program. Typically, that is not a concern of mine when I'm splitting out the property coverage from the liability coverage, right? There, it is, it is very difficult to find a place where that could overlap and create a gap. Property generally is property and the liability and casualty is just that. But when we start to see different casualty carriers used on the same thing. So if I have one carrier for general liability, if I have a separate one for professional, if I have something else for abuse, if I have something else for medical coverage, when you start getting multiple casualty carriers, that is a big concern. And we've seen, we have seen on more than one occasion coverage be omitted because, because there's a gap in the way the insurance program was structured. Risk tolerance and financial stability. Um, everyone's budget, um, I'm sure, can be stressed. Understanding where your risk tolerance is, where you want to use less or more risk transfer, it should be a thoughtful process, right? We run a business, we've got a couple hundred employees and, and a budget, you know, that's approaching uh, $60 million. So there, there are business risks that we take. Generally, we want to be aware of them and... <laughs> And be you know and be thoughtful about taking the risk. We don't. None of us as executives like surprises. Um, okay, Pete. I think we're about quarter after. And uh, if we have any questions, more than happy to open it up. All right, Josh. So we do have a few questions from the audience. Starting with number one, has the hard market impacted workers' comp the same way it has property and casualty? So that's a great question, Carly. Workers' compensation, we are not seeing as in nearly a hard market, right? We want to talk about predictability and when we talk about rates and the data, the information that is available on workers' compensation claims. And, you know, once somebody enters the healthcare system, there's never been better data available. So we've actually seen workers comp stabilize and maybe come down a little bit, again, because of the predictability of the risk transfer. So comp has gone in the other direction. And, uh, you know, payrolls have fluctuated as people pulled back during COVID. And then, uh, you know, now we're seeing payrolls on the rise again. But the rates in workers comp have stayed pretty flat, or even ticked down a little bit. Okay, and number two, what are some common exclusions carriers are trying to add to the GL policies? The most com most common exclusions would be things like um, uh, that they're trying to add. We're, we're seeing limitations in abuse on the top, um, professional liability in excess. We are seeing more and more lead exclusions um, and something called a um, um, something called a per location limitation where coverage could be universal before, but now it is uh, general liability coverage is limited to the specific locations listed on the insurance policy. So biggest limitations and exclusions are in excess liability 
lead on the primary and a per location uh, stated limit is what we're seeing on the primary general liability. Thank you. Um, next, I'm thinking of taking a higher deductible on my workers' comp policy. How can LAM help me make a prudent financial decision? So <clears throat> another good question. This, we go back to uh, that example we looked at with claims over the last three years. We'd kind of take those and say, let's put that to the side. We want to look at four, five, six, seven years back. We want to look at how the maturity of those claims what we would do is create something called a loss pick or really an expected amount of losses within a deductible limit. Um, with that, we'd go out to carriers and say, okay, what are you gonna charge in excess of this deductible amount? And then do a financial analysis on, um, you know, on how you can save money. When you take workers' comp deductibles, you essentially wanna set the deductible limit so that you're retaining 100% of the losses. When you so in order to do that, you really want to have a very predictable loss history, right? If I have two million one year and then five hundred thousand and then five million and then seven hundred and fifty thousand, something like that, I would tell a client this is this is absolutely the wrong type of loss picture to create a deductible with because we don't know what we're going to get. But if I see somebody that turns in, 2 million, 2.1, 1.9, 2.2, 1.75. I see a real predictable loss history. That's the type of policy where we'd say, okay, let's create a large deductible here. Let's try to retain right, on a policy like that. I would expect, I would expect the insured, if I had 2 million in losses, I would expect them to be paying somewhere around 3.75, 3.8 million dollars. So if we retained 100% of the losses and paid $2 million out ourselves, could we get it done by only paying a million in excess premium and save, could, is a million two five and save 500 to 700,000 bucks? So that's the type of analysis we do, but specifically on comp, we'd want something to, to do a professional job. We want something that has a very consistent loss picture. That would be my advice. Okay. In terms of risk models, if you consider only historical pre-COVID trends approximately three to four years ago, how do you take into consideration safety, training, and risk mitigation strategies implemented within the most recent three years that were developed in response to issues that occurred pre-COVID, but improvements slash results were not realized until post-COVID? Great question. That And that is, that's a tough one. That is an argument that we are making with our carriers when we're going out to try to to try to get a reduction in premium. Hey, just because there wasn't doesn't mean this organization hasn't gotten better. Um, if we were talking about our deductibles, the conservative approach would be to to not consider it. If if we were looking at our balance sheet and our financial statements, I would say we have not seen the results of that yet. So the more data that we have, the more the more accurately we can predict. To a carrier, we're going to advocate and and make the argument that this is a better risk, and uh, you know, and they deserve credit for the work they've done. When that happens, we're going to want to show documentation of the work that's been implemented, because anybody can say, oh, you know, uh, lamb insurance is a better risk now. But showing the documentation around what's been implemented, showing meetings minutes, the more we can prove that there actually has been implementation of risk management, the more credit we'll get in an underwriting model. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. And it's something that the industry, right? There's just not data. The data during COVID is not as reliable as pre-COVID -da, pre data. Um, so it's something that as an industry, um, it's, a, it's a struggle. Thank you, Josh. Next question. We still have five months until our commercial liability package renewal. How far in advance is recommended to begin researching the renewal? Um, so typically underwriters do not look at, they, they generally won't look at a file. The earliest they'll look at it is 90 days out. So the way a, I'm gonna, I will get to the answer from a consumer perspective. But let me help. Let me help explain how the insurance carriers are going to deal with this. 
if an if a renewal has to have has a increase greater than 10% or a material change in conditions carriers have to give notice 30 days in advance so that decision by a carrier has to be made 60 days in advance so they're reviewing every single account they have 60 days in advance because if they want an increase greater than 10% they have to make the decision then they have to get an official mailer out because New York state and most states still require official mail that can be tracked. So it's in your office 30 days ahead of the renewal saying your premium is going to go up more than 10% or I'm changing your terms and conditions. So that's what they're doing internally, which means, right, they're, they're busy looking at that stuff uh, in that 60 to 30 day window. Generally, carriers won't accept a submission before 90 days in advance. So you want we want to make sure the process is started and we get stuff in their hands at the 90-day mark. Our goal is to have an indication from carriers at the 60-day mark because we know that's when they're thinking about it and we want to deliver renewals to our clients at the 30-day mark. Um, that's our goal. We are subject to the carriers delivering we're subject to all of our clients getting us information to give to the carrier to get us the renewal on the new exposures. If I was going in the market looking for new coverage, I would be thinking about it 30 days. I'd be thinking about it at the 120 day mark because I wanted to give somebody information at the 90 day mark so that they could give something back to me in a timely manner. Got it. We have about five more questions, just a heads up with the time. Um, next question, you spoke before about reducing auto fleet to reduce risk. How can a broker help insureds determine which autos to reduce from a fleet? Seating capacity, age, maker model? Great. That's a, that's a great one. So we're, we're, we are really fortunate. Chris Dunlap runs our um, claims and loss control department. And Chris has done some outstanding work in vehicle tracking and putting, implementing GPSs in looking at routes and really the outsourcing which can be phenomenally effective um, is should be targeted on vehicles that have consistent routes um, so while we can look at older vehicles uh, yeah, and make a model the the most effective way to do this is say what vehicles are doing the same route over and over again because it is it is simple um, we work with a couple different organizations, happy to make referrals from people that want to hire somebody to come in and say, will you run this route for us? And there are professional organizations that have matrons in the vehicle that have cameras in and outside, the, you know, facing in the front windshield, facing in the back. Some of our clients for privacy pur purposes don't want the vehicles looking internally. Um, they have, we've, we, there are organizations with both options. Um, but the more consistent the routes are, the easier it is to outsource. Um, so th that has been the strategy that we've used, looking at the usage of the vehicles. Carly, I know you told me five more and I'm, I'm going on, but I like to, I finally have a moment where I can geek out a little bit. Awesome. Next question. If the abuse limit does get, um, submitted by the package policy, what are the options to obtain additional abuse limits? Sublimited, sorry. If the abuse limit does get sublimited by the package policy, what are the options to obtain additional abuse limits? Um, so typically, very rarely, but at times, you can go out and secure a monoline, you know, one line of coverage, just abuse. Um, more often, we see a change in carrier. Um, that... I, I am not a fan of the monoline abuse molestation coverage. Again, there's not a continuity in coverage. There's not necessarily the same language. We can, of course, we can review the language when it is necessary, or if we felt there was no other option, we can get that as a standalone coverage. Um, but it, uh, those pol the, the best strategy has been uh, to consider a change in carrier. There still are carriers that, that can give 10 million. Um, and when you have, consistent when you have consistent language in the underlying coverage as well as the excess liability uh, that is the most secure way to purchase that coverage but it can be done on a standalone basis 
Okay. What are some ways to approach funders or a board of directors to convince them that a high deductible is necessary when the policy historically was on a first dollar basis? So we have, um, so board of directors is a lot easier. I think that's an easier answer than a funding source. Um, we have, we've had several clients kind of go to battle with funding sources and we've had more success with clients getting lower limits acceptable than large deductibles. Um, we've had some, some clients with budgets over two and $300 million really do battle with funding sources over deductibles. Something as simple as a property deductible. We had a client that has 700 million in real estate values and a funding source that required a property deductible no greater than $25,000. And they went to battle with that funding source and they're in the housing and shelter space um, and were not successful and ultimately had to take just the $25,000 deductible for somebody that size and scale. That was a small amount. Um, board of directors, I think, is a different discussion. Using uh, using data, using information about historical losses, um, certainly we at LAM can help present to a board um, and we can present a financial data-driven package about why something like that would make sense and what is the likelihood of occurrence for uh, you know multiple claims within a deductible. I don't think it, it's not the financial, frankly, I don't feel like it is the financial um, information or, or decisioning that makes this tough. It's the funding sources more than anything else. Um, but, but with good data, uh, you know, it, it is not hard to craft a business case to take a deductible. Okay. And I'll combine these last two perfect timing. Um, how much of an increase year over year are you seeing because of the hard market? And do you anticipate any relief to the hard market over the next 12 months? So if we have clients that are getting five, six, 7% increases, that's a great renewal. Uh, that, that you're in five, so you're in the mid single digits. That's a really good renewal. That's take it, run with it. Don't ask any questions. Um, you know, the, we're still seeing carriers come out at, you know, those conditional renewals looking for, for 10%, 11, 12, and that's not unusual. Some carriers will go out at 9.9% because it is, uh, they don't have to send out a conditional. Um, so low, low double digits, um, low double digits is not a horrible renewal. It's certainly not great and, you know, should be fought. Um, but but mid single digits is a is a really good renewal. I hope that answers that part of the question. As far as the end of the hard market, I haven't. You know, I'm listening to carriers. We're we're part of associations that represent all brokers across the country. I'm not hearing discussion from any carriers individually about property and casualty coming back. Um, now things can change. They don't change super quickly. Think, but I would certainly say for the next six months, I would be I would be shocked if I saw anything change. Um, you know, when we talk when we talk in the middle of next year, possible things could change in the second half. But that's not the diet. That's not the rhetoric that I'm hearing from the industry. I'm hearing that this this will last through 24. This was awesome. Thank you for everybody that participated. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.